morning, uh, Baton Rouge. So um, I've been at um, LSU for almost 16 years. It'll be 16 years in August. And when I was your age, I thought I wanted to be a doctor. And so I went and I, I did some um, work with a physician, and I realized within about a day or two that wasn't what I wanted to do with my life. And because I came from a family where no one ever went to college, I really didn't know what else you could do with a, with a science degree, and I knew I liked lab work. So I decided to go to graduate school, even though I had no idea what I was getting into. But now, many, many years later, I'm really glad that that's the, the path I took, and I really like being a scientist in the biomedical field because I get to do whatever I want, and I get to travel all the, around the world on someone else's dime. So. And I get to interact with a lot of um, students, and I have postdocs in the lab from all around the world. So I really do love my job. And I'm going to tell you just a little bit today, um, you know, just a bird's eye uh, view of what we work on in my laboratory, which is really to study the pathogenesis of type 2 diabetes. So there are two different kinds of uh, diabetes, and some of you might already know this. The first type is called type 1 diabetes. And it used to be called juvenile diabetes, and it used to be called insulin-dependent diabetes, but we don't use those terms anymore. The American Diabetes Association said we can't use those anymore, and I'll tell you why in just a second. But there are about 25 million people in this country alone um, that have diabetes, but less than 10% of them have type 1 diabetes. And this is an autoimmune disease, and everyone who has the disease has the same thing wrong with them. And that is, they don't make insulin. Now, the type of diabetes that we study in my laboratory is called type 2 diabetes. And it used to be called adult onset, which it isn't anymore. And it used to be called non-insulin dependent diabetes. But also, it's not called that any longer. And greater than 90% uh, of the people who do have diabetes have type 2 diabetes. So this is the much more common type of diabetes. And the reason that type 1 diabetes is no longer called juvenile onset anymore because most people who have this di disease, they are diagnosed when they're a juvenile. But the reason is now we have this epidemic in this country of obesity that leads to type 2 diabetes, which I'll tell you about in a second. So it turns out there are more juveniles in this country with type 2 diabetes than with type 1 diabetes. So the government organizations and the private you know, um, organizations like the American Diabetes Association who, f who fund studies on these said, hey, we can't call type 1 juvenile onset anymore because there are more kids that have um, type 1. And that's the same reason why we don't call type 2 diabetes um, adult onset anymore is because there are lots of children that have this um, uh, disease. So I told you that people who have type 1 diabetes, they essentially all have the same thing wrong with them. They don't make this hormone, insulin, and it happens to be a hormone that's absolutely required for survival. But with type 2 diabetes, there's hundreds of different reasons or um, different pathogenesis that can take place for people to have this disease. So we have to have a way to diagnose all these patients that have this disease. So we define them as people who are insulin resistant. So they have plenty of this hormone usually in circulation, except the body can't respond to it. And so that's how we define type 2 diabetes. Because, you know, if you, I mean, I talk to physicians I work with, and they say, you know, if we could take 100, you know, human type 2 diabetics and do experiments on them, which of course we can't, then we would probably find that they all have something different wrong with them. Okay. So the point that I want to make here is just that type 2 diabetes has a very complex pathogenesis. And what I mean by that is there's just lots of different causes. So that's not true for type 1 diabetes. Everyone has the same thing wrong with them. Same for Huntington's disease, right? They're same for sickle cell anemia. There's a lot of diseases out there where that one thing causes that disease and that's it. But then there are diseases where hundreds of different things can cause it. And that's true for cancer and cardiovascular disease, and type 2 diabetes, which all are all the, the big killers in this country. And it turns out that type 2 diabetes is the fifth leading cause of death in the United States and the leading cause of blindness worldwide and also of uh, kidney damage. Okay, so probably you all have heard of insulin before. 
it's an endocrine hormone that is just made in one place in your body. It's made, you have this pancreas which does a lot of different stuff, right? And it's digestive enzymes and things like that. But it also has an important endocrine function. And that is to make this hormone called insulin in a particular kind of cell called the beta cell. And that hormone isn't made anywhere else in the body, right? Some proteins, they're made in every tissue or they're made in five different tissues. Not insulin, it's only made in this one cell type and we don't even have very many of those cells. We only have about a million of them to last us our whole lifetime, these beta cells. So that's where the, the hormone insulin comes from and what its function is, is it's pretty simple when you think about it. It's just to get glucose out of circulation and into your cells because when you have glucose in your circulation and it's too high, that is called hyperglycemia. And you think, hyperglycemia, how can that be bad for you? Glucose, it's a six-carbon sugar, right? It seems so innocuous. It's our universal energy source. All the tissues are taking it up all the time for an energy source. And yet, having too much in circulation, whether you have type 1 diabetes or type 2, which I told you the causes are very different, the clinical manifestations are the same. And that is, as I already mentioned, eye disease, kidney disease, and also neuropathies, where you lose feeling in your limbs, and as you probably know, diabetes is a leading contributor to, to limb loss as well. So what insulin does is, you know, hyperglycemia we know is bad, so this is a hormone that can get that glucose out of circulation where you don't want too much of it, and into your target cells where it can't do any damage to your eye and your kidneys and your, and your other organs. So to understand this, let's think about how glucose gets into the cells, right? Probably you know, you've all taken biology, so you know each cell membrane has, you know, a, 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 a phospholipid bilayer. And that's pretty impermeable. I mean, water can't get through, ions can't get through, and definitely glucose can't get through. But you need glucose in every single cell in your body. And it turns out the way that glucose gets in is every single cell in your body has this protein on the plasma membrane called GLUT1. And so what happens is when your cells need glucose, that glucose binds to that glucose transporter, which is shown in this picture as a gray circle. And a conformational change occurs in an, an energy-independent process that glucose gets in the cell where you metabolize it and use it for energy. And so every single cell in your body, pretty much for your, except for your heart, which relies more on fatty acids, is your cells are taking up glucose all the time and hopefully right now your brain is taking up the most because that's the one that, that uh, uses the most glucose. But it turns out that after you eat a meal, what happens is as you're absorbing that meal, that's when insulin gets secreted, right? Because after you eat a meal is when you have excess glucose in circulation and so now you need that role of insulin to come and get that glucose out of circulation. And so what insulin does, now this is, insulin is shown as a uh, orange circle here, is it binds its receptor on the plasma membrane of cells. And through a signal transduction cascade that's really well understood, the, the insulin phosphorylates one protein, which phosphorylates another, which phosphorylates another. And that communicates with these vesicles that are stored inside the cells. And that causes them, they're shown here in the ring of blue, that causes them to translocate to the plasma membrane. So now instead of just having those GLUT1 transporters shown in gray, you also have GLUT4 transporters. And so this process is called insulin-sensitive glucose transport. Now it turns out that after you eat a meal, and a lot of people don't know this, so maybe if, if you don't remember anything else I said today, maybe you'll remember this, is when you have excess glucose in circulation after a meal, that excess glucose does not, does not get evenly distributed between all the tissues, right? You're not getting a ton more to the brain, you're not getting some to the liver, the skin, yada, yada, yada. It's actually the excess glucose after a meal just gets targeted to two tissues, and that's it. And those two tissues are skeletal muscle and adipose tissue. And the reason that excess glucose only goes to those two tissues is because fat and skeletal muscle are the only two tissues that have GLUT4. And so all the other tissues just have the GLUT1 on the plasma membrane, so they're taking in the glucose. But the fat and muscle, now because insulin was there, they have the GLUT4 there, and it has a much higher affinity, so they can take that glucose in, store it, get it out of circulation, where we know it's bad for you. Now, when I first started studying diabetes about 20 or 25 years ago, I feel old today, um, 
everybody thought type 2 diabetes was going to be a disease about skeletal muscle. And the reason people thought that is because after you eat a meal, the majority of that excess glucose actually gets targeted to skeletal muscle. Only about 10% of it goes to adipose tissue. And since most of the glucose goes to muscle, you know, in 1989, people were like, hey, man, you know, type 2 diabetes is going to be disease all about defects in skeletal muscle. But we know now that that's not true, that people who have type 2 diabetes now either have defects in adipose tissue or in, uh, in liver. And if you ever, and this might be good in the future when you're doing some um, uh, report for class, but the CDC has all these cool statistics and PowerPoint presentations online for free. I'm just going to show you this one that is for obesity, but they have, the, they have one for type 2 diabetes that looks almost exactly um, uh, uh, like this. So these are some um, trends in obesity, and this isn't from uh, 2009. This is from 1999, sorry. And, and what you can see is that if you look at Colorado, it's the only one in blue, and it's, it's still the skinniest state. Um, only 10, for, 10 to 14 percent of the people 12 years ago were obese in um, uh, Colorado. But you can see that it was much um, higher in um, uh, Louisiana. And in fact, the Deep South has the largest rate of obesity in, in the United States. So, if we, so the, the epidemic of obesity is, is clear, and they think by you know, the year 2030 that 50 percent of people are going to be obese unless people change their lifestyle. So if you look at this CDC um, map from 1990, actually, you can see that in most of the states, they did not have obesity rates of over 10 to 14 percent. And then 10 years later, um, you can see that it, it increased. And then states in the Midwest and the Deep South had obesity rates of 15 to 19 percent. And then 10 years later, you can see, look at Texas, Louisiana, it's 25 to 29 percent. And now in Louisiana, we have over a 30 percent. Uh, obesity rate. So this is clearly an epidemic. And guess what? Our genetics haven't changed in the last 20 years, right? So this is something that is due to poor diet and physical inactivity. This, I mean, there are definitely no question about it. There are many obese people where it's definitely caused by some genetic mutation. But we can definitely say that this uh, epidemic that has occurred in your lifetime is, is definitely due to environmental factors like diet and exercise. And if you look at the incidence of type 2 diabetes, it looks exactly like this. So these two diseases are serious epidemics in, in the United States um, right now. And so we know, why am I talking about obesity when I study diabetes? And it turns out there is a very important link between obesity and type 2 diabetes. So one thing that we know is the majority of people that have type 2 diabetes are obese. Now, most obese people are not type 2 diabetic, okay? So there are a lot of people out there who are obese that are metabolically healthy. But most people who are type 2 diabetic are um, obese. And some things that are known is that if you lose weight or you exercise, you can get rid of type 2 diabetes. That's not true with type 1 diabetes. You've got to take insulin for the rest of your life, or you're dead, or you've got to move to another country where they allow stem cell transplants. But in the U.S., you're going to be on insulin for the rest of your life for that disease. But if you catch type 2 diabetes early, then if you can lose a little weight, or even if you don't lose weight, but you just start to exercise alone, even in the absence of weight loss, can ameliorate type 2 diabetes. So in the first stages of this disease, when people the first maybe five years, it really is a disease that you can, you can completely treat and get rid of, where we know that's not true for, for type 1 diabetes. So we have all these things that are associated with adipocytes, right? Obesity is just excess adipocyte accumulation. And we know that weight loss can get rid of type 2 diabetes. So how are fat cells controlling this metabolic disease that, that is affecting 25 million people um, in this country? And I just thought I would mention that um, HBO just recently did a documentary. It's four parts. And don't worry if you don't have HBO. It's online for, for free. And it's called The Weight of the Nation. And, and I know most of the scientists who are, who are interviewed um, in this. And, and the first part is really interesting. It's just called consequences. I mean, and, and the big thing about obesity is it puts you at a huge risk factor for cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, and cancer. And people still don't understand what the link is between obesity and cancer, but people who are obese 
are at increased risk for all kinds of cancers because you don't really get cancer in fat tissue. That's called a liposarcoma, and those are actually really rare. But if you're interested in this, um, there's a four-part series on HBO. You can watch it online for free, and I think it really gives you, um, you know, some staggering statistics about how much um, obesity and type 2 diabetes are causing, costing the U.S. now at a time, right, when we're in economic trouble already and our health care system is pretty screwed up. All right, back to adipocytes. What do these things do? So 20 years ago, people thought fat cells. Who the hell wants to study fat cells? All they do is accumulate lipid, and we know that. They store fat. But it turns out that they have two other very important functions besides lipid storage, and that is that they're highly sensitive to insulin. I already mentioned that to you because that fat tissue has that GLUT4 transporter that can go to the plasma membrane and let glucose in, and the only other tissue in your body that can do that is muscle. So fat cells are very sensitive to this hormone insulin. And then it's been discovered in the last 10 years that just like the beta cell is an endocrine organ, which makes insulin, or the pituitary is an endocrine organ, which makes uh, growth hormone and prolactin, it turns out fat tissue is an endocrine organ as well. And this isn't in any textbook yet, even though it's been known for about a decade. But there are actually three hormones that are made exclusively in adipocytes and not any other tissue. And those hormones are called adiponectin and resistin and, and leptin. And they have functions all over the body. The leptin acts in your brain to, to send satiety signals to indicate whether you're hunger, hungry or not. And adiponectin and resistin are both hormones that act on the liver and act on the muscle and regulate insulin action in those two. And so that's how disrupting adipocytes can result in disruption of skeletal muscle, which we know is the tissue that takes up most of the glucose um, after you um, eat a meal. One other thing I thought I'd mention is if you take one of these three functions of fat cells and you disrupt it, if you change its ability to store lipid or you make it so it can't respond to insulin or you change just one of those hormones I showed you, type 2 diabetes. So that's how important fat cells are in the pathogenesis of type 2 diabetes. You change just one function one of those functions of fat cells that can lead to insulin resistance and type 2 um, diabetes. So our overall hypothesis in the lab is if we understand basic biology in fat cells, this may provide us clues to the pathogenesis of uh, type 2 diabetes. And we've been focusing on lots of different proteins. I don't want to go into the, to the nitty gritty because I don't think you'd be that um, interested. But we largely study um, uh, proteins that are called transcription factors, right? They're master regulators. They go into the nucleus, and they're responsible for regulating the expression of a lot of genes. So they kind of have more power than a lot of other proteins because they actually control what proteins get expressed um, in, a, in an individual cell. So a lot of the projects in my lab have to do with the transcriptional control of adipogenesis. And adipogenesis is just a fancy word for fat cell development. And so we understand how these, how these cells arise, how you go from a pre-adipocyte into a mature um, adipocyte. And then we see how these transcription factors are important in regulating genes that get screwed up during type 2 diabetes. One of the transcription factors that we study in our laboratory is called PPAR gamma. It's a nuclear receptor. It's highly expressed um, in fat cells. It's not expressed in too many other cells in the body. And another reason um, that people realized that um, fat cells were so important in the treatment of type 2 diabetes is there was this drug. It was developed by Upjohn and then Eli Lilly a long time ago. It's a class of drugs called thiazolidine dions, and they make people insulin sensitive. This has been known since the 70s. But they didn't figure out till 1996 how it worked. And the way that it worked is it activates this transcription factor that's only in fat cells. So by restoring insulin sensitivity in the fat cell, you can restore insulin sensitivity in the whole body. You can control the muscle. And the way you can do that is because now the hormones that are made in the fat cell, they go back to normal instead of you know, physiological conditions instead of pathological conditions. And so this is another piece of evidence to suggest this link between adipocytes and type 2 diabetes is that one of the type 2 diabetes drugs that is on the market is actually an activator for this transcription factor that's primarily expressed um, in fat cells.
Um, one, I told you one thing I love about my job is I get to travel, and I actually did go over to Cambridge, England um, for, for six months, and I did some PPAR gamma um, studies over there, so I just thought I'd show you a pretty picture of uh, England. Um, a couple months ago, I, I gave the, a talk on our, our research at um, Harvard Medical School, and I talked about the primary um, projects in our lab, which have to do with this JAK-STAT signaling pathway. And I'll just tell you about this very briefly, but it's a signaling pathway that's in every single cell in your body that's used by lots of different hormones. There's probably tons of hormones out there you've never heard of, like leukemia inhibitory factor and oncostatin and cardiotropin-1 and CNTF. But probably you've heard of growth hormone and prolactin. But all those hormones that I just mentioned use this signaling pathway, where the hormone binds the receptor, you get a conformational change, it phosphorylates this other protein called the STAT, and that translocates to the nucleus and regulates uh, gene expression. So that's very different than insulin signaling, where you have this very you know, um, uh, quick phosphorylation, and you don't really have a lot of events in the nucleus, because they need to happen quick. This is very different, where you actually have increases or decreases in transcription. And so I won't go through this, but there are lots of different hormones that use this JAK-STAT signaling pathway. And we study all these hormones in adipocytes. And also, when you have adipose tissue, there are lots of other cells in adipose tissue besides adipocytes. And so we study um, those cells as well, in including immune cells that can infiltrate into um, adipose tissue. So this one transcription factor we studied was called um, STAT5A, and we did some studies about 10 years ago. And the way that we showed this, could, we could put this transcription factor in any cell type, and when we did, we could turn it into a fat cell. And the way that I'm showing you that here, without explaining all the details, is that when you see that red color, that's a stain for lipid. So you see, if we put in the vector, we don't get the red color. But if we put in the STAT5A, we got the red color. So we showed, at least in cell culture or in vitro, we could take this transcription factor and make, here we just use BALB-C cells, but we use lots of different kinds of cells. And we said, hey, we can make fat cells just by turning on this transcription factor. And we knew that for a while. But you know, I go to meetings, and people will say, that's great. You can do that in cell culture. But can you do that in the whole animal? And so we actually recently did these experiments in what are called athymic mice. Because you can't just inject cells into a regular old mouse or rat because they're going to um, reject them because there's going to be an immune response. But these animals have been irradiated and they, they don't have any more immune response. So you've got to be real careful with them, put them in sterile environments. But what we did is we took our cells that had that transcription factor and we injected them into these athymic mice. And what we saw is, and I think you can see it pretty clearly, um, you know, there on the chest, that's where we injected the mice. So we inject these cells that aren't fat cells, that have our protein in them, we think can make fat cells, and then it makes, six weeks later, we've got a fat pad right at the site where we injected the cells. So now we know that protein we, we are studying, it doesn't just cause fat cell formation in cell culture, it also does it um, in vivo. And then the last thing I thought I'd mention uh, very, very quickly is that another project in our laboratory is there's five centers around the United States where there are botanical research centers. And each center gets $10 million from, from the government to study botanicals. And the reason for that is unlike drugs, which are FDA regulated, all these supplements, if you go to GNC or Smoothie King or Walmart and get St. John's Wort or ginseng or echinacea or whatever you get, none of that is FDA regulated. There's no guarantee that there's even St. John's Wort in that stuff that you buy. So the government is getting kind of sick of this because people spend $28 billion a year on these supplements. And half the time, you know, most of the time, they're botanical supplements. But they usually don't even have the active ingredients. And there's never been any clinical trials to show whether they're effective or not. So for example, I think people spend $28, $25 million a year on St. John's Wort in this country because it's reported to have anti-depression anti effects. But the NIH did a double-blind, placebo-controlled study, and they showed there was absolutely no effect. So I mean, people take stuff, and the placebo effect is big, right? You know, there's a 20% placebo effect. So you know, maybe it works for those people who think they're getting something better. But anyway, this is why the government is investing um, money in this. And so we, we have a project in the laboratory where we've screened over 500 botanicals. This was actually done 
by a summer student um, a, a few years ago. And we're trying to find ones that actually promote adipocyte development because we know that when you when your fat your lipid is actually stored in your fat tissue, you're much healthier. And so you would think that things that would block adipocyte development might be good for you, but they're not because then that fat gets stored somewhere else and then you're insulin resistant. So we actually have been screening for botanicals that promote the formation of healthy adipose tissue. And, and we, found, we found one that in the Russian tarragon family. Um, it's this Artemisia species. And we've done some experiments in vitro and actually uh, the HHMI student, Cody, who is working in my laboratory this summer, is going to analyze these mice that we have shown here. And these are mice that are already diabetic. You can see they're kind of obese. We, we, we've characterized their diabetes. And then we fed them this botanical for two months. And we're going to see if feeding them that botanical in their diet corrected their diabetes. And so that's what Cody is going to do this summer, is analyze the fat tissue from these animals and see whether it's still insulin sensitive or not, or whether this botanical was able to um, improve that. So in review, hopefully you know now type 1 and type 2 diabetes are very different diseases. Type 2 diabetes is usually accompanied by obesity, but remember most obese people are not diabetic. There's an epidemic of obesity and type 2 diabetes in this country, and also it's starting to become prevalent in other countries like China and India as well. If you change one function of a fat cell, that can lead to insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes. The reason we study fat cells in my lab is to determine causes of type 2 diabetes, and we've been able to determine lots of different causes of type 2 diabetes in the last decade or so. We've also identified transcription factors that can control the development of adipose tissue, both in culture and in the whole animal. And as I told you lastly, we're part of the Botanical Research Center at the Pennington to study botanicals that improve insulin action because people are really trying to look for, you know, because drug development to get a drug to market, a diabetes drug costs over a billion dollars. So people are starting to look at plant sources now where development of drugs could be much um, cheaper. So actually I moved my lab a year ago over to the Pennington Biomedical Research Center on Perkins Road and um, the people listed in orange are all the people in my lab and um, thank you for your attention.